peacock throne of Vive for 25 centuries. It is now occupied by His Imperial Majesty, Muhammad Reza Pahlavi, Shah and Shah, King of Kings. And at his side stands the beautiful Empress, Farah Deba. But for all the splendor which surrounds the throne, typified by the ceremony of his coronation in 1967, the Shah of Persia approaches his kingship with a remarkable degree of realism and political awareness. This 52-year-old man holds absolute authority. Only once in 30 years has his right to rule been seriously challenged. Throughout, he has reigned as a benevolent despot, retaining all real power in his own hands. This week, Echo looks at this man and his country, Persia. Persepolis, center of the Persian Empire founded by Cyrus the Great in 538 BC. In that year, Cyrus, having conquered the Babylonians, issued a declaration of rights, pronouncing every man free to worship and travel as he pleased. He welded together a dozen different nations and ruled the world from Libya to India, from Russia to Arabia. And even when Persepolis was sacked by Alexander the Great, Persia remained intact. Today, Persia's rugged terrain borders on Pakistan, Afghanistan, Soviet Russia, Turkey and Iraq. Despite centuries of invasion and political pressure, Persia still holds the turbulent middle ground between the differing worlds of its neighbors. But the power behind the Shah's throne is what lays beneath it, oil. The ocean of crude oil underneath Persia's desert was first discovered in 1908 and led the way to the Middle East oil boom. At first, Persia sold concessions on its oil wealth to Western companies, but as the industry grew, so did Persian control. Now she earns a thousand million dollars a year from oil and further income from piping natural gas to Russia. Persia is moving up in the world and oil is paying the way that, as the Shah himself acknowledges, the oil will not last forever. It's not eternal. It is an eternal source of uh, supply. 20 years, 30 years, 50 years time, it will finish. In many cases, this is the only source of wealth of some countries. It's not the same in mine. It's true. But actually, it is the principal source. And it is with the money from oil that we are building up our country. If you have riches, you defend them. Consequently, the Shah has built an armed force of 170,000 men and equipped them on a scale quite staggering for this part of the world. The Persian army dwarfs those of Iraq and some other Arab neighbors who deride the Shah's pro-Western attitude. But with such an army, he can ignore them. And if you have an army which is not actually fighting, put it to work. In fact, the Shah used his army to launch an offensive against Persia's chronic illiteracy. In 1963, it spearheaded the White Revolution, a package of educational and social reform which largely offset unrest amongst Persia's left wing. The army's literacy corps set up thousands of schools throughout the country to bring education to Persia's 28 million people. And today, a massive school building program is being undertaken to complete the process. Gradually then, the pattern of Persia is changing. Women still spend a lifetime weaving a carpet as they always did. 
But outside, in Persia's rapidly expanding industrial sector, these are boom times. The Shah delighted Persian businessmen by welcoming foreign companies from Japan, Europe and America, offering them facilities, tax concessions, an expanding market and a growing force of semi-skilled labour, particularly in the car industry. The export of such vehicles helps keep Persian currency reasonably strong. The power for Persian industry comes from hydroelectric schemes like this, northwest of the capital, Tehran, built by French engineers, paid for by Persian oil. Persian peasants get irrigation from the dams, but they got their land from the Shah. In the 60s, he initiated sweeping agrarian reform, giving away great chunks of privately owned land to the sharecropping farmers. It was a bold social move and a shrewd political one. Now electric power has reached nearly every corner of the country. Everyone has gained something. In terms of prestige, the Shah most of all. In cities like Shiraz in southern Persia, the frantic race to achieve so much before the oil runs dry seems to threaten the existence of Persia's ancient culture. This is the country whose phenomenal industrial growth rate is approaching that of Japan. But Persia remains Persia. The man and woman on the street is deeply conscious of those 25 centuries of history and not a little surprised at modern Persia's sudden and unexpected rise to prominence in the Middle East and the world. These are heady days for Persia, flexing its muscles as a political power barely a decade after it seemed likely to squander its wealth and opportunity as some other oil-rich countries have done. Persia has lately assumed a more neutral stance, treading a broad path between east and west, but visibly leaning more west than east. The resultant peace and stability have had their inevitable effect. And the vast majority of the people are prepared to attribute it all, rightly or wrongly, to the Shah. In October this year, Persia officially celebrated 2,500 years of the peacock throne with a dazzling display of splendor worthy of an emperor. They erected a latter-day pyramid as a lasting memorial to the Shah and invited kings, queens and statesmen to the week-long festivities at Persepolis to celebrate with them. It was a huge public relations exercise, perhaps, paid for to the tune of $30 million by the Persian people and timed nicely by the Shah himself as the latest in a chain of events designed to draw world attention to modern Persia. But for all that, the Persians appear happy to foot the bill. After all, theirs is a king who has personally given away a fortune to promote education, initiated far-reaching land reform, and raised the Persian standard of living high above that of many of her neighbors. In short, a good king. Dramatically, Persia has emerged from its past to become a recognizable power in the world. Little more than a decade ago, it was engulfed in an orgy of internal political squabbling which forced the Shah into exile and threatened to end his reign. But since then, the palace in Tehran has been the center of government and the Shah the master of Persia. Opposition in his own country is minimal, given the turbulence of the world which surrounds him. And there has been only one attempt on his life. But his survival owes nothing to his capability for dodging an assassin's bullet. Everything to a remarkable political agility in the Byzantine atmosphere of international politics. His skill, a fair measure of good luck, far-reaching social progress and an abundance of oil have kept him ahead of the game. If his political dexterity ever played him false, or if good fortune deserted him, he would be in trouble. But if the oil runs dry before the Shah achieves his ambition,
to transform his ancient country into a modern state, the Peacock Throne might become the hottest seat in the Middle East.